Greetings, everyone, and thanks again to all of you who keep coming back for more. This is the China History Podcast coming to you from ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. We're still in the Ming Dynasty. In our last episode, we got as far as the end of the Yongle era. The Yongle Emperor, also known as Ming Chengzu, he passed from the scene in 1424. So as we begin today, we're merely 56 years into a 276-year dynasty. 220 more years to go. So let's get started. The Yongle Emperor dies on his fifth campaign in the north against the Mongols. He led the army. His eldest son becomes the new emperor, and he immediately puts the kibosh on Zheng He's extravagantly expensive uh, voyages. The problem with this emperor was he wasn't fated to live long. He became emperor in September 1424 and died of a heart attack May 29, 1425. Not exactly uh, William Henry Harrison, but he didn't even last a year. This is too bad, because in the short time that this Hongxi emperor sat on the throne, he undid a lot of the bad ideas of his father, the Yongle emperor, and instituted a whole bunch of new reforms that he was able to initiate, and then his successor, his son, Zhu Zhanqi, is next on the throne and reigns as the Xuande emperor. And you may recall this emperor from the last episode is the one who called for the one last voyage for Zheng He and the great eunuch admiral died on this seventh and final mission. And it was during the reign of the Xuande Emperor that Ming China's misadventure in Vietnam came to a crashing end in 1427. Now, one of the last things the Hongxi Emperor did before he up and died so suddenly was he tried to move the capital of the empire from Beijing back to where it had come from down in Nanjing. However, he died before this whole initiative could get some traction, and when the Xuande Emperor got all settled in, he decided to stick with the Forbidden City rather than Nanjing down in the south, which, uh, if I haven't mentioned, is a savagely uh, hot city in the summer. It's, uh, Nanjing is known as one of the three furnaces of China, the Santa Huolu, the other two being Wuhan and Chongqing. Sometimes they say the four furnaces, the Sida Huolu and Changsha, gets thrown in there. That's the capital of Hunan province, my old stomping grounds back in the early 90s. So the Xuande Emperor, he stays put in Beijing, and other than the misadventure in Vietnam, which he inherited, by the way, it was a relatively peaceful time. The economy thrived, and the Xuande Emperor, being an accomplished painter and all, uh, it was a time when the arts also thrived. He carried through all kinds of reforms and was able to keep the machinery of government running smoothly. His decade on the throne is considered the time when the Ming Dynasty peaked. Xuan De was followed by his son, who we know as the Zheng Tong Emperor. Yes, he of the Tu Mu Crisis, or the Tu Mu Zhibian. He was all of eight years old when he took the throne, and by this time you had what was known as the Neige, or the Privy Council, established in 1426, and this was heavily staffed and influenced by the eunuch faction. Let's talk a little about eunuchs, and then we'll get back to the Zhengtong Emperor and his infamous debacle at Tumu. One of the main characteristics of the Ming Dynasty was the rise and influence of the eunuchs, and how they used their ways to pretty much take over the government. They were sort of, in a way, you could compare them to the president's White House staff. No one elected them. They were all appointed or got their positions due to connections. Their natural enemies were the bureaucracy. You know, all the Confucian scholar bureaucrats who did everything by the book and with a great degree of ritual and strict orthodoxy. And the eunuchs, they didn't really have any Confucius or Mengzi. They took all the worst aspects of autocracy to new heights and were notoriously corrupt. In fact, one of the many characteristics of the last two dynasties of China was the extreme influence the eunuchs had on palace affairs. The problem all started during the time of Yongle. You see, his father, who founded the Ming Dynasty, he made it clear from the very start that eunuchs were not to be educated and under penalty of death were not to meddle in politics. End of story. And then 50 years later, their tentacles are on every single knob, lever, and switch on the entire government and military. How did they do this? How they did this was quite simple. The Ming emperors, uh, starting with Yongle during his later years, became more and more 
autocratic. The more autocratic you became, the less you depended on, trusted, or cooperated with the normal channels of government. Rather than going through them, you, you just made decisions unilaterally, but you still needed enablers and facilitators to make this whole system work. And that's where the eunuchs came in. You see, the root of all their power rested on the position they held as being responsible for the person of the emperor. Not the laws or agricultural matters or anything scholarly. Their sole responsibility was the emperor personally, as well as his family and household. Anything that had to do with the emperor, from who got to see him, what he ate, when he did what, and everything that he was about. The eunuchs were the gatekeepers, advisors, go-betweens, and household managers. What did they do, actually? Well, for starters, they managed the palace guard, which by the time of the Xuan, the emperor had already evolved into a kind of secret police that was engaged in all manners of nefarious activities. They managed all the workshops and businesses that supplied everything there was to the emperor's household, as well as the steady flow of the exotic gifts presented to the emperor by visiting foreign tribute missions. When it came time to make military and civilian appointments, they had the emperor's ear for all this. The eunuchs were also appointed directly by the emperor to head up trade and diplomatic missions to the various kingdoms of Southeast Asia and the Western Sea, a.k.a. the Indian Ocean. So they managed quite a bit of what went on in the capital. Everything they did, of course, being at the crossroads of all military and commercial wealth, involved a nice, generous portion of cream that was skimmed off the tops of the thousands and thousands of day-in, day-out transactions involving the emperor and the imperial court. They got a piece of everything. It was sort of like the, the neighborhood where Pauly ran things in Goodfellas. Anyone who did anything that involved the emperor had to pay their tribute, knowingly or unknowingly. And these eunuchs enriched themselves. Some of them, such as Li Lianying, chief eunuch under Cixi Taiho, the most famous of all evil emperor's dowagers, amassed fortunes that were the stuff of legend. We'll look at this most famous of eunuchs when we get to the Qing Chao Monyan, as they say, the last years of the Qing dynasty. So, during the Ming, you begin to see the rise and unstoppable power of the eunuchs who rode on the backs of increasingly autocratic emperors who more and more came to distrust the legitimate government officials of the imperial government and in the provinces. In fact, by now, during the time of the Zhengtong emperor, the privy council, led by the most powerful eunuchs, had replaced the normal organs of government. And these two factions, the eunuchs and the Confucian elites and the government bureaucracy, they battled constantly and honestly couldn't stand each other for the threat they each posed to the other. And to top it all off, as an extra reason for mutual contempt, these eunuchs, by and large, were all northerners who came from a lower-class background and were hardly educated. The civil servants were, for the most part, coming from the families of the literati who came from the lower Yangtze Valley and around Zhejiang province. So you had a northerner versus southerner thing going on, and an educated versus uneducated, and of course the ongoing competition to sway the emperor's decisions. Eunuchs ran the privy council as well as the imperial secret police. During the emperor Hongwu's era, you had the what was called the brocaded guards. During the Yongle era, you had the Eastern Esplanade. By 1465, there came into being the Red Horsemen of the Western Esplanade, who became the thugs, hitmen, agent provocateurs, and enforcers of the imperial eunuchs. So, let's look at the sixth Ming emperor, and I include Jian Wen and Hong Xi, even though certain revisionist emperors tried to write them out of the script. Zhu Qi Jun was born in 1427, six years after the capital was officially moved to Beijing. He was the son of the Xuande emperor and became emperor as a child of eight. Now, if you are a eunuch working at the palace, this is the best-case scenario. It was easy enough for them to bend the mind and will of a full-grown adult. But an eight-year-old kid? As far as having a free hand to do whatever you wanted, I mean, what else do you want? Enter Wang Chen. He was the chief eunuch under the Zhengtong Emperor, and he called the shots. Every one of them. He instigated what is known as the Tumu Crisis. The Oirats were Western Mongols, more from Central Asia than from the North. For years, the Ming had been playing them off against their eastern Mongol rivals. But after the Ming pulled their horns in around the end of the Yongle era, the Mongols started to 
smell blood, and became very aggressive in testing the softness of the Ming. In the 1430s, these Western Mongols had penetrated into Gansu, Xinjiang, and Shanxi. Then, in July 1449, after a bit of a diplomatic blow-up and misunderstanding, the Oirats invaded northwest China with a force of 20,000 men. The Zhengtong Emperor gets this real great advice from the chief eunuch, Wang Zhen, who whispers in his ear, Hey, you know, you gotta go attack these guys, and it'd be great if you led the troops into battle yourself. And the emperor, he's 22 by now, and his chief eunuch obviously had a very strong influence on him, so the army is amassed, and you have the Zhengtong Emperor at the head of a force of half a million men. That's 500,000 against 20,000. So, should be a turkey shoot, right? It ended up being a 28-day campaign. Here's how it went. Now, historians have picked this whole affair to the bone, and all generally agree this was a totally unplanned, poorly led, and ill-fated campaign. You had the emperor in charge, who in short didn't know anything. His number two was the chief eunuch, Wang Zhen, who was simply detested and reviled by basically everyone. And his baggage train alone was over 1,000 wagons and had to be guarded. And the weather was horrible as they left uh, the capital. It rained all the time. The main idea was to engage the Oirat forces near Datong in the north of Shanxi province and push them back into the steppes where they came from. By August, the going was getting very rough, and the civil officials were all saying, oh, hmm, maybe it's not the best idea to bring the emperor with us. But Wang Chun wouldn't hear of it. He said, nope, the emperor stays. On the way to Datong, the Ming forces passed the site of a battlefield. It's just littered with Chinese soldiers killed by the Oirat Mongol forces. And after the Ming forces arrive in Datong on August 18th, they're advised that to proceed further north and carry out this campaign into the steppes would be highly risky. Datong is in the extreme north of Shanxi province, but not too terribly far from the capital, Beijing. So the Ming generals and everyone just declare victory and start heading back to Beijing. By August 30th, the army's uh, now in bad shape from this march back to Beijing. It's hardly this you know, orderly military march that you'd expect from a trained army. It's, it's degraded down to an unorganized retreat. And then three days out from Beijing in northern Hebei, the Oirat Mongol army catches up with the Ming rear guard, which, as the story goes, was so burdened with Wang Jun's thousand wagons of whatever. So these guys were all picked off, as well as the 30,000 cavalry sent to support them. And then the next day, at a place called Tumu, the Ming army, who had no access to water and were just dying of thirst, food had run out, they were so close to home and now the Mongols were just all over them. Dissension ran rampant in the ranks. Troops deserted or tried to defect. The traveling officials insisted it was best to send the emperor on his way back to the capital now with a guard. But Wang Jun refused because he insisted to accompany the emperor, and as the story goes, he was so concerned about his baggage train that had not yet caught up to the, to the uh, front. So on September 1st, the army awoke to the Mongols who had quietly surrounded them, and then a battle ensued, and when all was finished, about half the remaining Ming army was gone. Wang Jun was killed, most likely by his own people, and there was no shortage of soldiers, officers, and officials who wanted this guy dead. So he was gone, and they captured the emperor. The Oirat Mongol leader, Isen Khan, was just incredulous that such a prize fell into his hands. The emperor of China leads his army into battle, makes every mistake that Sun Tzu probably warned against, and ends up getting taken as a prisoner of the Mongols. Isen Khan tried to use the emperor as a bargaining chip, but he didn't have any luck in the utter confusion that was going on now in Beijing. What followed was another classic Chinese imperial bloodbath, this time with the eunuchs on the receiving end. The aggressors were now the Confucian palace elites and their minions. With Wang Jun out of the picture, the eunuch faction at the palace was hardly the menace they once were, so they just got annihilated. It's said Wang Jun was the scapegoat for the whole sorry affair, and his family was killed for five generations, including the children he had sired before he became a eunuch, which was done to further his career. The Mongols march on Beijing, but they're unable to take the city. Then the alliance between the Oirats and their Mongol cousins in the east and north just sort of falls apart, and they once again turn on each other, and Beijing is spared. 
The Tumu incident has been compared to the Anlushan Rebellion of the Tang Dynasty, and that here was the clear dividing line where henceforth it was all a slow, steady, downhill slide for the Ming Dynasty. The powers that be decide that the best course of action is not to bargain with the Mongols and to install the emperor's brother on the throne. And this they did. So, the Jingtai Emperor becomes the next son of heaven. And that, my friends, was the Tumu incident of 1449. So, other than having lost half their army to a force less than 10% its size and the emperor getting captured and taken away, it wasn't a bad campaign. But wait, it gets worse. A year later, with a new emperor on the throne, the old emperor gets handed back to the Ming in China. The Mongols, frustrated in their attempts to gain anything from this nice bargaining chip, simply sent him back, asking for nothing in return. So one day, the Zhengtong emperor just shows up. Now, there are two legitimate emperors. The Jingtai, who was now installed on the throne, and the newly arrived Zhengtong emperor. Now, the Ming bounced back from this to a certain extent, thanks to some talented ministers in the government who managed to steer the Ming through this period of chaos and treachery. The new emperor, Jing Tai, he was allowed to continue to reign. The Zhengtong emperor was kept as well as a sort of a reserve emperor with a grand-sounding title. Actually, the Jingtai emperor, weary of a potential rival, kept this Zhengtong emperor under a, a form of house arrest. And in 1457, when the Jingtai emperor started to decline in health, the Zhengtong emperor was brought back onto the throne, which pretty much makes him the Grover Cleveland of the Ming dynasty, seeing as how he had two different reigns as emperor, non-consecutive, that would make the Jingtai Emperor the Benjamin Harrison of the story. The Jingtai Emperor had other plans as far as a successor went, but a little intra-palace skullduggery saw the palace officials literally walking in on Zheng Tong, lifting him onto a sedan chair and bursting their way into the palace of the emperor, and they unceremoniously plopped the old emperor back on his old throne. So for this reign period, the name Tian Shun is given. So this Ming emperor is known both as the Zheng Tong emperor and the Tian Shun emperor. As for the ailing Jing Tai emperor, eh, he died under mysterious conditions a month later. And to rub salt in the wound, the Tian Shun emperor, as he was called now, wouldn't even allow his brother, the Jing Tai emperor, to be buried in the sacred Ming tombs. He was buried out somewhere else, and the Zheng Tong emperor had his Rivals severely demoted in rank as well. The Tianxuan Emperor dies in 1467, all this excitement packed into only 37 years. So, he passes from the scene and gets entombed honorably with his Ming ancestors, and next up was the Emperor's son, who becomes the Changhua Emperor. What is there to say about this teen emperor, except that the eunuchs made their comeback under his reign and the Worst autocratic measures to date are seen. The secret police is enhanced and became a terror no less than the Gestapo, Cheka, or Securitate was in their day. He reigned for 23 years before he died at the age of 40, and his son takes over as the Hongzhi Emperor. The Hongzhi Emperor was one of those rare breed of monogamous Chinese emperors who had only his one empress and that was it, no concubines. So finally, they get a good, hard-working, no-nonsense emperor on the throne. The Hongzhi Emperor, almost but not quite, is mentioned in the same breath as his ancestors, the Hongwu and Yongle emperors. He kept the eunuchs reined in, and for his almost 18 years in the top spot, the country caught sort of a breather. He was the last good emperor. His son took over from him, and since there were no concubines involved, there were no potential successors or rivals to the remaining son of the Hongzhi Emperor and his Empress. So, enter Zheng De. Now, close your eyes and think of Caligula. That's what this emperor was. A total wastrel who neglected his duties, spent long periods away from the palace, traveling around with his entourage and spending lavish amounts of money. He left everything in the hands of eunuchs who were only too happy to oblige. One eunuch in particular, Liu Qin, really made a name for himself and got himself immortalized in the history books thanks to the magnitude of his corruption and the wealth he amassed and the fortune he spent. 
Now, Liu Qin was the head of the Ba Hu, or Eight Tigers. These were the eight most powerful eunuchs who ran everything that went on during the reign of the Changde Emperor. Now, this guy had a great run, and to go down in the annals of Chinese history as one of the most corrupt government people of all time must have meant his scale of skimming off the top would have ranked right up there with the best of the 20th and 21st century. In fact, in 2001, the Asian Wall Street Journal ran a story that named Liu Qin as one of the wealthiest persons in the past thousand years. Why else is the chief eunuch Liu Qin also famous? He was caught committing treason in 1510, and his punishment was the infamous death by a thousand cuts. Yes, the Sha Qian Dao... Liu Qin was not the first. When the executioner took that first slice off the former head of the Eight Tigers in 1510, this punishment had already been around for half a millennium. What it was, for those wishing to know, was death by slow slicing. Liu Qin was given a total 3,357 cuts over three days. Now, he was given 3,300 cuts, but he allegedly died on the second day after the 300th or 400th cut. It said bits of his flesh was then being sold on the streets of Beijing outside the palace and being consumed with rice wine. Anyways, there's all kinds of interesting and gruesome material on the internet if you want to learn more. This is a family program, so we don't want to get into too much detail. It said they hauled about 450,000 kilos of gold and 9.7 million kilos of silver from his compound, which at today's extremely high uh, precious metal prices would put that fortune at roughly 30 to 35 billion U.S. dollars. So, Liu Qin, he met a vile end and perhaps a fitting end, depending on how you look at it. Well, the Zhengde Emperor, being a Caligula type and all, there were no shortage of stories about what went on during his almost 16-year reign. But seeing how this is an overview and all, let's not get bogged down in the zaniness and carnage. The other important thing that happened in the Ming Dynasty during the reign of the Zhengde Emperor was the arrival in 1513 of Jorge Alvarez and Rafael Perestrello, who worked for the Portuguese trading empire of Afonso de Albuquerque. They traded with the locals and had a skirmish with the Ming government forces down in the south and Tuen Moon in Hong Kong and also up the Pearl River Delta towards Guangzhou. Relations were stop and start between Portugal and China, but this mission ultimately led to the deal with China in 1557 that ceded Macau to Portugal, uh, which was to be used as a trading base. The next emperor was one of the more famous ones, and we mentioned him already, the Jia Jing Emperor. He was the Zhengde Emperor's cousin. This emperor reigned for 45 years, and lots of stories about him. Where to start? Let's just dive right into the Great Rites Controversy of 1521 to 1524. Okay, as I said, this new emperor was not the direct descendant of the deceased emperor. The new 14-year-old emperor was a cousin his father was the brother to the Hongzhi Emperor. The Hongzhi Emperor, remember, the one who didn't keep concubines, he had two sons of which only one survived, and he became the Zhengde Emperor. And then he dies in 1521. So custom dictated that the imperial line of succession could not be broken, and in order to keep everything in line with the established ways, the new Jia Jing Emperor had to be adopted by the deceased Zhengde Emperor, and then... As custom dictated, the new Jia Jing Emperor would honor this deceased emperor as a son would a father. Then all was okay. The line was not broken. This was the way the Confucianists got around that small problem. And the 14-year-old emperor, everyone thought, mm, it would be easy to manipulate. Not so with this emperor. He had his own thinking about this whole matter. His thinking was simple. All they had to do was make his natural father emperor posthumously, and the whole matter was solved. A seemingly innocuous matter could not be so easily resolved. And the Confucianist officials had made somewhat of a comeback, and their their prestige in the Ming Dynasty now had never been higher, so it wasn't so easy to dismiss their insistence, you know, to have their own way. So this matter of the emperor insisting to honor his natural parents and the court officials saying he had to do it according to the Confucian rites was the root of this controversy. The emperor won, of course, and all those who tried to line up against him were banished or executed or worse. And things were never the same after that between the emperor and the Confucian elites. 
Like his predecessor, this emperor had no love of the actual work involved in being the chief executive. He mostly lived outside the Forbidden City and had his trusted prime ministers handle everything for him, and this, of course, is a recipe for disaster since it was an open invitation for corruption. He was autocratic and couldn't take any criticism or challenge to his authority in any way. He left everything mainly in the hands of his chief minister, Yen Song, who was another rogue from Chinese history, known for his cruelty, vices, and corrupt, self-serving ways. There was, though, a loyal official, the department secretary to the Ministry of Revenue, a guy by the name of Hai Rui, well known for his devotion to the emperor. He did a bold thing and wrote a memorial to the emperor requesting him to be more open to advice from his ministers. He said everyone was so scared to say anything that good advice was just being withheld, you know, fearing the consequences. So Hai Rui spoke up and for this, he was thrown in prison and stayed there until this emperor died in 1567. Now, this is important because 400 years later, there was a play written about Hai Rui who historians had held up as a model of the quintessential honest, loyal, and dedicated civil servant. The play, written by the great historian, writer, and vice mayor of Beijing, Wu Han, came out in 1961 and was called Hai Rui Dismissed from Office. Hai Rui Ba Guan, five years later, 1966, and 400 years after it actually happened, one of the gang of four, Yao Wenyuan, lashed out at Wuhan and his play and claimed that the whole thing was simply an allegory of Chairman Mao's dismissal of the loyal marshal Peng De Huai, who dared to speak up to Mao against his excesses in the Great Leap Forward. Hai Rui was compared to Peng De Huai, and Mao, of course, was the evil emperor, dismissing his loyal official. So, believe it or not, this was one of the spark plugs that ignited the Cultural Revolution, which we'll get to one of these days. So, the Jia Jing Emperor, no friend of the Confucianists, didn't like to get involved in daily affairs and left everything in the hands of those he trusted. His chief guy, Yen Song, pretty much ran things for 17 of the 45 years this emperor stayed on the throne. This long-reigning emperor was completely into Taoism and involved himself in all kinds of these Taoist practices and ingested all kinds of elixirs of life that might give him immortality. These elixirs included menstrual blood of young girls, powdered excrement of young boys, and I'm sure all kinds of other dubious concoctions. In October 1542, there was a plot carried out by his concubines to assassinate him in his sleep. See, he was a cruel and brutal emperor and apparently didn't treat his concubines well. So there was a plot to strangle him in his sleep that ultimately failed, and all of those involved in the assassination plot were given the same fate as the eunuch Liu Jin, the death of a thousand cuts. And you know how it was in China back in those days. The families of the plotters were, of course, also killed. So let's jump to 1556 to the Hua Xian Da Di Zheng, also known as the Jia Jing Da Di Zhang, January 23rd, 1556, the deadliest earthquake in recorded history takes place. In Western history books, this event was known as the Shanxi Earthquake of 1556. Its epicenter was in Hua County in Shanxi Province. This is about an hour and a half east of the ancient capital Xi'an by car. This is the famous earthquake I'm sure you've all seen at the top of, you know, any of these lists of the worst natural disasters of all time. Approximately 800 to 850,000 people died in this shocker. I mean, the destruction was incredible. A lot of people back then were still living in these Yao Dong, which were these, you know, essentially these little dugout caves carved into the Loess Hills. Loess, or less, is this, this sediment that blows in from the Gobi Desert that sort of builds up over time and, and hardens. It's not very strong, but it's very convenient to live in. You know, think of a substance that, like, it's like part stone, part sponge. I mean, not exactly like that, but I think you get the idea. He had this whole plateau called the Lois Plateau, the Huangtu Gaoyuan. It covered 640,000 square kilometers, almost a quarter million square miles, stretching from Gansu, Ningxia, Shanxi, and Shanxi. People just carved a home out of the side and just moved right in. 
And this earthquake, these Yaodong just collapse so easily, just killing everyone inside. And this is how a lot, if not most of the people died. The earthquake was so violent that the earth was actually splitting and, and where there were valleys, suddenly it became a mountain and, and vice versa. I mean, rivers suddenly changed course and caused massive and sudden flooding. Of the entire region that was affected by the earthquake, which was uh, a total of 98 counties over an area of about 520 square miles, 60% died to give you a rough idea how deadly this event was. It was estimated, I don't know how they figured this out, but they said that the quake was an 8.0 on the Richter scale. Although the shocks were felt beyond the epicenter into many provinces, the greatest amount of death and destruction were in the two provinces of Shanxi and Shanxi. Now, this, you'd think, would be a harbinger of the end of the dynasty. I mean, something this massive surely made everyone think about whether the Mandate of Heaven was ready to pick up and move elsewhere. But there were still 88 years left in the Ming Dynasty until the sad and tragic ending in 1644. A couple other things we should mention regarding the Jia Qing era. The Portuguese were really making inroads into China. They were really the first Westerners to get in good with the imperial government. In 1557, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Macau was given to the Portuguese as a trading base. They had been there since 1535 when Macau's port was used as a place to weigh anchor. No one was permitted on shore, but they were allowed to sail their ships there to rest. Then, in 1552, they were given permission to build storage facilities on shore to warehouse things. And finally, in 1557, they were given formal permission to establish a settlement on Macau with a rent of 500 tails of silver per year. It's not very well known, but the Portuguese traded for a while in Chinese slaves, which were prized in the New World as well as in Portugal. This practice didn't last long and was outlawed in China in 1595 and in Portugal in 1624. So now you have the Portuguese down in Macau, and they'll use that as their base, not only for trading, but for spreading the Catholic faith into China. And in the next episode, we'll look at Matteo Ricci, the Jesuit priest who did so much work in Chinese studies, as well as trying to establish the church in China. Before we go, let's look at a couple last significant personages from this period in Ming history. First, let's mention Qi Ji Guang. General Qi left his mark on Ming Dynasty China as the one who finally rid the China coast of the curse of the Japanese pirates. This had been a problem for centuries, and these Japanese pirates were just unstoppable. They caused all kinds of grief along China's coast in Shandong, Jiangsu, Zhejiang, Fujian. They were called Wa Ko in Mandarin and Wa Ko in Japanese. The Portuguese joined in on the fight against the Wa Ko and played a supporting role in pushing the Japanese out of these pirate lairs. As an encore to this achievement against the Japanese pirates, Qi was sent up north to deal with the Mongols, and it was he who gave the Great Wall, especially near Beijing, a total makeover and had these battlements built and spaced out throughout the entirety of the wall. And there over a thousand of these battlements, and that it gave the Great Wall of China that look that we today are most familiar with. And if you ever go to Fujian, you could eat a guangbing, a nice little palm-sized cake with a hole in the center. The story goes that in 1562, when Qi Ji Guang was leading his troops against the Japanese in Fujian, they were really holed up there, and the local people made these cakes with a hole in the center that could sort of all be strung together and carried in bulk by the soldiers. To commemorate Qi Ji Guang's spectacular victory against the pirates, this bing, or cake, was named after him and is still enjoyed today. So don't forget to have a guang bing next time you're in Fujian. Last but not least, we can't not mention Wang Yang Ming, a giant, if there ever was one, in the field of Neo-Confucian philosophy. Aside from being a successful general and one of the first to use these newfangled breech-loading colors Wolverine canon that the Portuguese had brought to China, he was mainly known for his contributions to Neo-Confucianism. Among his chief teachings was the idea of innate knowledge, and that all people were born with the knowledge between good and evil. 
He said this knowledge was intuitive rather than rational. Wang Yangming had said in his teachings and writings that the world does not shape the mind, but the rather the mind gives reason to the world. The mind alone is the source of all reason, and that man had an innate moral goodness and understanding of what is good. So Wang Yangming, he was the fourth of the four great masters of Confucianism. The other three, of course, being Confucius, his pupil Mengshis or Mengzi, and Zhu Xi. Zhu Xi, of course, the great philosopher who we mentioned in the episode of the Southern Song Dynasty. So the four great masters in Mandarin are referred to as Kong Meng Zhu Wang, Kongzi, Mengzi, Zhu Xi, and Wang Yangming. All my Taiwan listeners will know uh, Yangming Shan up in the north of Taipei. That mountain is in that area is named for this great uh, Ming Dynasty philosopher. And we'll close with the death of the Jia Jing Emperor, he who hated his job and left the levers of government in the hands of others, some good, some bad, and some real bad, like Yan Song. He died in 1567 after 45 years and 241 days on the throne. You'd think with this long of a reign, he'd be the champion of the Ming Dynasty as far as, you know, longest reigns went. But next episode, we'll look at his grandson, the Wanli Emperor, who reigns for a total of 48 years. It's said this Taoist and pleasure-loving Jia Qing Emperor died of mercury poisoning ingested in one of the many elixirs of life he consumed, chasing the same dreams of Ponce de Leon and Qin Shi Huang. The Jia Qing Emperor reigned a long time, and there was relative peace during his time, but the dynasty was in decline, and his failure to show leadership, to revive things, kept the Ming Dynasty on a slow and steady course towards extinction. And next week, when we do the Ming Dynasty Part 4, they'll be washed away from power and into the history books. So, that is it for today. Well, not bad. Foolish me, thinking I was going to be able to cram 220 years into this podcast. By this time in Chinese history, so much is happening so fast, and so much history was recorded by this time. It's not like the Bronze Age dynasties when who knows what is fact and fiction, and we can cover whole dynasties in a single podcast episode. But we managed to get through 130 years today, so not too bad. We'll pick up next week where we will finish off the Ming in 1644 and take a close look at how the Manchus rode in from the north and swept the Ming from power and established the last dynasty of China. That's next week. For now, this is your humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, bidding you once again a fond farewell from the lovely little town of Claremont, California, home of Saka's Mediterranean cuisine, my local falafel and shawarma joint. Stay well, everyone, and we'll see you next week, I hope, for another exciting edition of the China History Podcast.